with Lowell. I am your host, Lowell Thompson. This podcast is first and foremost about learning. We will learn about the different avenues for success in biotech, healthcare, and related science fields through conversations with startups, researchers, and policymakers, CEOs, experts, you name it. We're going to have it on this podcast so you can learn about the different ways people are achieving things in the industry and how you can do the same. Or just learn about great science topics. I consider there are two main types of episodes. The first type is what I consider a case study or mini biographies where I communicate with a person about a specific topic, usually what they're trained in or have experience in, so you can get a sense of who they are, what they do, and what they're passionate about. And it usually comes with a a lot of advice at the end. The second type is a symposium topic, or a group topic where I interview a bunch of guests around a central theme, such as like how to get venture capital for a biotech company, how to affect change in Congress. That's going to be a fun one how to eradicate an illness. Tune in every Monday for email blasts if you've signed up for them at my website, Learning with Lowell, to get book recommendations, website recommendations. I mean, really, you're going to get a lot of content from that every Tuesday for new episodes. And every Thursday, I'm going to do a blog post as well. And we have a Facebook, a Twitter. We're on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, TuneIn. Basically, device connects to the internet. You'll be able to get these podcasts. Please leave a review and tell everyone, please and thank you. Today we have Dr. Kate Kruger of New Harvest. Her background is in protein biochemistry and cell biology. She got her PhD in May 2017, so it's about a year she was in graduate school. She got a degree from Yale University, which is pretty cool. And in this episode, we get into the cool things that New Harvest is doing with cellular agriculture, grant opportunities, how to get involved, things you can do to help out in pushing this field, the amount of money that is in cellular agriculture from a nonprofit standpoint. Why does this nonprofit exist in this space, like or in, in any space like this? It kind of explains the role of non for profits as pushing the edge of innovation and helping build the infrastructure for change. And we get into all that in this episode. I think those are the big key things that you're gonna learn. You're also gonna learn some of the cool things that they are helping develop, like the cutting edge research. If you enjoy this type of content, please let me know so I can get more stuff like this. Newharvest.org. They have conferences coming up. They have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You know the whole thing, but just check it out. It's pretty great. What brought you to New Harvest over all the things you could do? You know, presumably you could be an accountant. Why did you choose this path where you're the director of research at New Harvest? When I started grad school, like a lot of academics, I kind of thought I wanted to be a professor. And I was kind of doing all the things you do if that's kind of on your career kind of outlook in terms of research and building up kind of the standard skill set. And as I kind of moved on through grad school, I realized there were a lot of skills that that track wouldn't use so much that I really enjoyed using. Things like working with a little more people, doing some management, building curricula, building programs. And a lot of people do find ways to do that, I know, in academia. But I kind of wanted to make those more central components to my career rather than, say, publishing, for instance. I started looking down a lot of paths and kind of going down a lot of rabbit holes. I did a lot of teaching in grad school. I got to design a course. That was a really cool experience. And I kind of, from those experiences, I kind of thought I needed to see a little bit more of the real world. So that led me to intern at Perfect Day Food, Berkeley. And Perfect Day was the startup that, one of two startups, in fact, that was created by our executive director at New Harvest, Isha Dattar. Interestingly, what I was doing there was very similar to a lot of the stuff I did in grad school. So in grad school, I kind of had a structural biology sort of background. So things like EM, crystallography, biochemistry, some sort of cell-based assays. And so interestingly, when I was at Perfect Day, the first thing I was doing was purifying milk proteins. So and and basically deciding how to clone those milk proteins. So it's very similar to what I was kind of doing at the bench. Uh, lots of kind of what's called the construct design, where you're figuring out which chunks of genes to make, get the protein you want downstream. I was very excited about that because basically I, I showed up there and there was this ACTA doing chromatography that was exactly like ACTA back in my home lab. So that was very heartening. It was pretty cool. So I really enjoyed working there. And from there, I kind of was able to get a little bit more of a broad sense of what it's like to work in cellular agriculture. And from there, I kind of was able to learn a little bit more about New Harvest and what its role was. And so when New Harvest was looking for a research structure just happened to coincide with when I was finishing up my PhD. So I was fortunate enough to be able to join New Harvest in that capacity. So now that I'm research director, I manage our fellowship program, all of our research oriented activities, activities and kind of promote basically our our cause and our organization more in standard academia as well. It's a good way to describe New Harvest. It's it's kind of like trying to build the infrastructure so that innovation happens quicker. Yeah, so we like to say we're kind of like the multiple sclerosis foundation of cellular agriculture because usually 
what to get a pharmaceutical off the ground or to cure cure cancer it requires a lot of people. And interestingly, because of the types of products that cellular agriculture meat makes, speaking of milk, egg and cheese and other things from and meats from cell culture, that that process and the science behind that is actually very similar to what happens in the pharmaceutical industry and what happens in the tissue engineering world. Those things are, are the closest related to really what we do. And similarly, the workflow is kind of similar in terms of how you get a product off the ground. So basic research the initial experiment that leads to a drug is something that's funded by the government that's the most common kind of way that these experiments get done and then that research will get picked up by a nonprofit like the multiple sclerosis foundation and then it often gets picked up by a drug company of some sort or another and there's some squish back and forth and in terms of who gets involved when. But that's kind of the standard flow because oftentimes pharmaceutical companies are not so interested in getting involved until they're pretty certain that they're going to have a positive product to come out out of this whole process. That's one challenge we have in cellular agriculture is, first of all, that these are very complicated things we're making. And second of all, that there's like no money in this space for funding the research. So in total, New Harvest's funding, which is about on the order of a million, million a year, give or take, is like basically most of the money that goes into cellular agriculture research in the world, which is kind of crazy. Because if you think about the billions of dollars we spend on various diseases, such as cancer, or the billions we spend in agricultural research, it's just kind of absolutely dwarfed by the fact that we have, you know, in the US, roughly a million dollars going to this research. That's interesting. I, I kind of thought when I was reading it, that it reminded me of like solar energy, bringing, yeah. you know, bringing your stuff more local instead of having like these large supply chains where you have to pull from these, in some situations, very delicate food webs. Instead, you can, you know, grow things, you know, right down, right down the street or, you know, in your, in your country. Yeah. And, and that is in theory, like, like one of the goals, but to get there first, we have to get all the innovation to make mm -hmm. that be a possibility for people. The current burn, how long do you think it would take before someone is able to make something that is tasty? That's a really hard question. The way we like to answer it right now is that it will, would take quite a long time with the current amounts of money that are going into this space. But that could change very quickly if more funding came into the area. I was, I'm really surprised it's only like a million year. I think there would be... Yeah, so the caveat with that I do want to add is that companies in the space do get private investor money. And, and while that's cool, and we're totally enthusiastic that investors are investing in those companies. There, there are some things that funding a company will not do for an overall field. It won't get you openly available scientific literature that other people can refer to. It won't get you resource centers. It won't get you open licensing that can help make these technologies cheap and easily available. So while in theory, you might get a product through a place, you won't really get the kind of network or framework to have further innovation happening. Yeah, there is certainly funding that goes to companies, but I do kind of want to make that difference because like, like first of all, I don't know off the top of my head exactly what the funding that goes to companies is. We could probably crunch that later if you're interested. It's just, it's so different because it, it doesn't fund the landscape in the way that funding research does that makes sense I, I would want especially with a new field you, i would want it to be kind of broad before people start patenting it and making it narrow and that's the thing is we're enthusiastic about all funding in this space so if people want to give to companies that's great we also would encourage people though to see the role of like funding kind of the underlying organization that can help make resources available make skilled employees available our research fellowship program trains a lot of people up through graduate level, also postdocs, to enter this space really highly skilled. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because it's kind of like you can't really, you wouldn't ever think about having a pharmaceutical company and being like, oh, well, why would we have the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation? Because they actually do like pour a whole lot of money like upstream into like helping all the companies succeed. Feel like there's there's lots of use for lots of funding in this space all over the place. I think about it right now. It's like it's like solar. It's like it's one of those things that, especially with the issues we're having with sustainable anything, <laughs> it's good to have another option that doesn't deplete from the food web. I completely agree. And that's the thing is the Department of Energy has been really good with doing a lot of the basic kind of upstream funding for things like solar. 
And that's something we'd love to see the government do in the future when it comes to cellular agriculture. We're like super enthusiastic about that possibility. But yeah, as it stands currently, there there aren't any of those relationships set up yet. Is there anything we can do to be helpful? So people can always reach out to their representatives and let them know they're really excited about cellular agriculture and funding cellular agriculture. There are divisions of basically Congress does have different sorts of caucuses that work on things like choosing using which research kind of is worth funding and such. And so definitely look up the R&D caucus, I think is the best thing for at least American listeners to tune into is check out the R&D caucus, check out the people in that group, and encourage your national representatives to contact those individuals and to let them know that you're interested in funding basic research in cellular agriculture. What is your daily life like? You you said you kind of help out with the fellowships and finding good grant people. Have you ever thought about like making a Libby or Skillshare type course that teaches this stuff? Because you said you, you teach graduate level people. But I'm just wondering like how to disseminate that to a wider. Have you ever like considered something like that? So right now we're currently developing an online course. It's like a Cellag 101 course. So we don't have anything to share from that just yet because it's currently in development. But that's going to be an online course that's going to be available for anyone who's interested in taking it. All it will work prior basically is a high school level understanding of science. It'll teach you all the basics of how cell ag works and what the kind of components are and what goes into it. Excellent. I will keep my eye out for that. Is Do you ever wonder if people are going to, like when this technology becomes more readily available, that people will make weird meat or like weird stuff? Yeah, I think it's quite possible. Like, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, you know, if you remember like Gringotts, different types of jelly beans. Like in theory, you could have like earwax flavors and all sorts of stuff, but <laughs> I mean, like, I think because of market demands, it's highly unlikely that those will, you know, really catch on that much. But yeah, I think they're, I mean, I was having some conversation the other day in the office about like, if meat gets so cheap someday, I mean, people could just start snacking on meat all the time instead of chips and stuff. Like, you never know. Well, I'm just thinking like soil and grain, maybe people start making people meat. And then, I don't know, I feel like people would do that. There'd be like one guy who makes that company and like starts like producing human beef. There's been some interest in culturing a lot of different types of meat. Panda meat, I've heard mentioned. Lots of different animals, rare animals. There's a there's some interest in culturing woolly mammoth meat in George Church's lab at Harvard. The sky is kind of the limit once you get the technology in place, which is, is non-trivial. But yeah, I mean, it could be really cool. I mean, definitely things like glowing meat is not crazy to imagine. All sorts of various things so meat that changes color when you add acid to it or whatever if you want to cook something in vinegar and have it change color you could do all sorts of things i, I would imagine like chefs would get in on this like oh hey we can make really unique dishes is there other industries that are going to be benefiting from the research and innovation that you guys are trying to push people trying to build like a heart for instance that works like is there any like cross talk or there's so much cross talk so a lot of our scientists come to us from a background that has something to do with bioengineering or chemical engineering. Basically, we're trying to do the same thing, except what we're trying to do is actually simpler than what they're trying to do. So it's a lot easier to think about just making a chunk of meat than it is to think about making a functional heart. People are really, really, there's there's a lot of crosstalk, especially in like the tissue engineering sort of world. We've all got the same goals. So if they win, we win. Kind of. Well, maybe a partnership opportunity there. But what does like a day in your life look like? Like what? So a day in the life is it really varies. So we do some traveling to different places. I remember my second week on the job, I got to go to NASA and talk with the scientists there about open food systems. Because interestingly enough, when you start looking at space travel into the deep space gateway heading towards Mars, food becomes a consideration. And while Food is not considered, or food manufacture becomes kind of a consideration, kind of on the path to space. While food manufacturing in space is not considered mission critical currently, that could be changing once once those deep space missions start kind of becoming closer to a reality. So we are there discussing what a bioreactor kind of for space might look like or what concerns are, or what considerations are for kind of open development of these things. So that was kind of like a random thing that happened one week my second week on the job. That was pretty crazy. Um, but it, it really, really varies. I do a lot of reaching out to scientists who are interested in working with us in a variety of capacities. One of the things I do is kind of connect highly skilled people that have 
complementary expertises on these kind of larger projects that we're organizing. So I do a lot of that, soliciting proposals, writing grants, speaking in some cases, a lot of a lot of stuff. I mentor all our graduate research fellows as well, too. We have a distributed group meeting for Slack once a week. So those are pretty hands-on. We really get into the weeds on how, how research is going and how different methods are working and stuff. So yeah, it's it's a it's a fun mix of different different things every day. How how is the research going? Is uh, can we talk about that? It's going great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what? I was like, can we talk about this? Like, uh, how how is the research yeah. going? Yeah. So it's really exciting. Within the past year, we doubled our fellowship program from three students to six students. So right now we have a chemical engineer, three biological engineers, and a developmental biologist, and a food scientist slash food physicist, I think is the term. Well, he's, he's in the physics department, but his background is in food science. So we've got a good mix of folks now. They're doing really interesting things. Anything from taking a fruit, like an apple, and decellularizing it. So it's just the cellulose kind of matrix. And then growing cells on that. So that's a really kind of exciting thing. Is It turns out muscle cells really like growing on these decellularized fruit and vegetable matrices. So... That's like a really cool low budget project that's really taking off in some interesting ways. What else is cool that's going on right now? Let's see. Our fellow in the UK is working on bioreactor kinetics for these types of bioreactors that are called hollow fiber bioreactors. So it's funny. When people think of bioreactors, they think of things that look like what you would grow, what you kind of would make beer in, right? So it's sort of a big metal vat. But that's not really what they look like for cultured meat. And that has to do with a lot of reasons. When cells start stacking on top of each other, it makes it hard for them to get the nutrients they need. So in very short order, on the level of microns, they start dying. And so because of that, you need these different systems that will allow them to get nutrients. And so the bioreactors that are best for allowing these cells to get the nutrients they need while still growing with all their kind of needs as mammalian cells are these things called hollow fiber bioreactors. So our fellow in the UK, uh, Scott, is um, working with Dr. Marianne Ellis, who is an expert in hollow fiber bioreactor design. And so these things are really interesting. They kind of look like collections of giant noodles. You could imagine like a bunch of, like if you took a package of spaghetti and blew it up until the spaghetti noodles were about six feet tall, that's sort of what a hollow fiber bioreactor looks like, except you've got to imagine ports at each end connecting these sort of spaghetti s- strands and that the spaghetti s- strands are actually hollow and they can put liquids through them. So that's kind of more what the bioreactor would look like for cultured meat. So they're, they're do- working on that right now. We're very excited about their progress there. How do the noodle thingies make meat? How does that work? The interesting thing is cells are actually on the inside. of the, They're kind of like straws a little bit. And they've got these kind of, basically the cells are inside there. The goal is that the, the cells can get thoroughly, they're always in contact with the media. So it's more rapid exchange of nutrients. Oh, okay. Because I, I keep picturing Star Trek where they go, and then like they build like a burger. Yeah, yeah. People think, and so there are some interesting things that are like that, but not so much for cultured meat. Yet yeah. there are things like skin guns. I don't know if you've heard of those that are from the kind of tissue engineering world where people who have really serious burns can get skin cells kind of air sprayed onto them, sort of like spray paint, but with skin cells. So you can do that for skin, but the problem is that doesn't really have a structure to it. And also that's more like dispersal to like fix a person up. Whereas if you're like trying to grow them in bulk, you need more like contact with like media and such. And skin guns are more just for dispersal of. It's funny, but there are there is some interest in things like food printers and such. Yeah, not so much for burgers. Maybe one day. Maybe one day, right? Like, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, this this area is really ripe for innovation. So, is there anything in the media like Star Trek or, or whatever that really captures what it actually looks like to make lab meat? That's a really good question. One thing that I always find a little interesting, pretty closely related, although very futuristic. Is, I don't know, have you heard of the Shojin Meat Project? No. They're out of Japan. And they funded a lot of their early work through the creation of these comic books they call fanzines. And so they've got a lot of really good artists on their team who will kind of uh, 
draw these great kind of illustrations of these people that look sort of like anime characters growing meat in in futuristic sort of settings. That's really cool. I pulled it up. Yeah. Yeah, their stuff is awesome looking. They're really fun. Has there been any talk about doing that at New Harvest? We've never done that particularly, but we are very interested in kind of representations of these things and kind of what people imagine and what people kind of see coming out of this. So there's an artist named Oren Katz who spoke at our last conference who has done these kind of artwork projects surrounding like cultured food generation. So things like growing a frog's leg in culture and then serving it to people is kind of a, an artwork. But yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. We haven't done too much of that particularly. A lot of people involved in New Harvest are very design minded. So we're very interested in having like nice kind of representations of things. But no, we haven't really gone there yet particularly. You were telling me about other cool things. Was the spaghetti thing the last thing or were there other cool ones that you guys have in the works so this is so challenging little because i actually there's a lot of stuff going on that we just can't talk about yet because it's too early stage so that's that's where i tend to work with a lot of the things like kind of hard to talk about things till we get contracts inked and stuff so some stuff that we can't talk so much about that i'm really excited about so give me like six months and i happily tell you but let's see what else that i can talk about We've got a fellow who's working on a bunch of porcine cells. She's doing a lot of sort of how you grow blood vessels using pig cells. So that's that's really interesting. What else is interesting? I remember a technical question that maybe is in the line with the research. In the AMA you guys did, there was a person who asked about fetal bovine serum and how, and then you responded mm-hmm. that New Harvest is looking to develop cell lines that do not require FBS. So yes. why is that such a big deal? Like, why is that something that you guys want to develop over having that? So fetal bovine serum, as you probably know, is the fetal is the is a component of fetal cow blood that's often added to mammalian cell culture because it's got a lot of amazing things in it that really help cells grow very well. It's got a lot of growth factors, special nutrients, really high protein content, lipids, hormones. A lot of stuff that really stimulates cell growth. And it's so powerful that usually your standard mammalian cell media will be about 10% FBS. And even cell lines that aren't mammalian, so you wouldn't think they would need fetal bovine serum, often have 10% FBS anyway. So shrimp culture, for instance, you know, the media to grow shrimp has 10% FBS. FBS because it's just amazing for growing cells. There are lots of challenges associated with using FBS because, well, it's this great kind of elixir for your media. It's expensive. It comes from animals. There's batch to batch variation sometimes. And beyond that, like if you're doing certain types of science where you're making proteins, FBS is really not ideal because it has such a high protein content itself that you're going to get a lot of background or extra things that aren't what you're trying to make. There are lots of good reasons to not use FBS. Industry has come up with a number of proprietary formulations that do not contain FBS and additionally like large scale manufacture. They also have come up with ways to not use FBS, but those formulas are in general proprietary. And so the challenge is like, what do you do if you want to use a culture media that doesn't have all these problems without spending essentially 40 or 50 bucks on 500 milliliters of media, which is really prohibitively expensive. Of course, if you bought it at scale, you know, that would cost less, but that doesn't really get at the heart of the problem, which is that we'd like to see an open source formulation such that people aren't reliant on this material in the cellular agriculture space. Basically, that has to do with cost effectiveness. It has to do with wanting a product that is vegan and and wanting a high quality product that can do exactly what we want. And pharma has done a very good job of coming up with solutions for that. Recent developments like CAR T therapy, if you basically were, these T cells get grown, get isolated from a person's body, grown outside the person's body, and then put back into the person's body as a therapy. It's a really powerful strategy, but Obviously, for that, you want the perfect media formulation that's really ideal for a human so that wouldn't contain things like something from a fetal cow. It would just be like human proteins for human use. And so ideally, honestly, for like meat production, for a 
pig cell line, it would be ideal to use recombinant pig proteins in a media formulation, probably at vastly lower quantities than they are in FBS2 for that matter, because the protein content in FBS is just off the chart, which is just unnecessary. So really, that's, that's a goal of ours is to work on research surrounding serum-free media formulation and also open cell banking to help with that process. You mentioned before that I think denatured apples, you like break down apples, meat likes to grow off of what you break down. So is there a lot? Yeah, decellularized apples. Yeah, there you go. Not denatured. <laughs> the, is, there, no is there a lot of kind of like mix and match like that? Or, or do, do things tend to be species specific when it comes to trying to get things to grow right? It really depends what you're dealing with. So what we were talking about there with the decellularized like apple, the different muscle cells growing great, it's like scaffolding materials are fantastic. And oftentimes they don't need to be identical at all to the cells that are growing on top of them. So other types of scaffolding can come from fungus or from this material called chitin, which can either be grown through fungus or it can be grown through the exterior of um, shellfish. So for scaffolds, Really, the sky's the limit, although in general, I, I would at least think we would want something pretty cheap. So you don't want, you know, something outrageously expensive, like, say, silk, for instance, even though silk is edible and works really well as a scaffold. That'd be really expensive. So and it would also involve animals. So that wouldn't be ideal either. But when it comes to things like matching proteins for species, sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. People have to kind of test it out. Fetal bovine serums work really well for a lot of species, but that doesn't mean you couldn't do better, you know, and it doesn't mean you couldn't tune things exactly to your system. Is there any progress on creating this specificity or is it still kind of years in the in the in the future so there's been some really interesting work that's been done in a bunch of labs there's a lab in china that recently had a publication that was quite promising for a method for determining which media can map really well onto how, uh, basically how to define a media formulation that will map really well onto a certain cell type people are interested in this it's just rare that people choose to do it in an open manner when you ha get publications from other countries like china and stuff do you is there ever any efficacy issues you know i haven't ever noticed anything like that yeah i mean that's one of the things i love about science is how international it is and how international actually the culture meat world is and cellular agriculture much like a lot of this other stuff is very international as well no we love working with groups in other countries and oftentimes it's really interesting too if you look at grad schools in the u.s and institutions of higher learning a lot of people tend to be international because oftentimes science education is more rigorous outside the u.s and i say that as an american so it's 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 not as though i I, I don't wish Americans the best. I really do. In general, people from other countries are oftentimes pushed a little bit more towards science and stay in science a little bit more. So it's a very international space. It's a little bit rare sometimes to find America, but the cultured meat world has a good mix. Are you a nerd about anything? <laughs> Let's see. I'm like, yeah, you probably call me a nerd. I'm kind of a Trekkie. Actually, I shouldn't say I'm kind of a Trekkie. I'm really a Trekkie. I'm very much a Star Trek fan. I like hiking a lot. I like... Which generation do you like? I like most of it. So the only one I, I'm not a huge fan of is the original. I think my favorite is Space Nine. Let's see what my next favorite is. Next Gen is very good. Voyager's okay. Do you have a favorite? Uh, next Gen. I, I like Picard. And Data. He's so cool. Data's awesome. Man, it's really hard to be Data. The thing is... Data can run an entire ship by himself. He's basically a little guy. So <laughs> said you liked hiking. I like hiking as well. Yeah, hiking's great. I brew ginger beer. Yeah, I don't have too many other nerdy hobbies other than those, I guess. Um, you're like the third scientist I've talked to that brews alcohol in their free time. Yeah, I feel like it's a super common one. The other one is making bread, which I've done a little bit of. My sister's a chemist and she does a lot more bread than I do. Yeah, it's something where you've got a living organism doing science, you know, so it's like it's very engaging, I feel like, for people. I, well, I, I want I don't drink alcohol, but I'd make it. Yeah, right? Like, I think it's really fun because yeast are just so good at what they do. It's really fun to like, you know figure out what your goals are for like a beverage and try to like make it happen. I think that's what I enjoy the most about it. I thought it would be funny if you were a ginger and you were making ginger beer. I don't know why that amused me more than anything else. I'm not, unfortunately, but it would be super funny. Yeah, no, 
It's really good. Um, what else do I do? I guess the one thing that is related that I thought was rather interesting is recently I've gotten into weightlifting, a lot of free weights, which I find kind of funny because I, I think about muscle cells a lot during the day. And now I'm thinking about muscle cells when I work out too. So I have so much more respect for muscle. It's like really hard to generate muscle, I feel like. Yeah, especially for a female. Yeah, right? Definitely don't have like testosterone as much, which is so helpful, I think. Well, I could like go to the gym and I, I look bigger after like three days. Yeah. Oh, I'm so jealous of men and their ability to put on muscle. It's really like nuts. When it when it comes to grants and fellowships, which, you're, which you guys are always more people to partner with, who are the type of people that you have you have found to be the best type of partners? First of all, we're interested in everyone who is interested in reaching out to us. We're happy to talk with anyone. So if you're remotely interested, please do email me and I'd love to get in touch and uh, connect you with the proper paperwork and chat with you about our process. But in general, I'd say the best hallmarks are people who have been in science for quite a while. So people who are either mid or late grad students, so years three, four, five of grad school, or who are postdocs who are maybe a little bit further along in their science career. We're not your standard funders, so we're not like purely obsessed with people's publication record like some funding agencies are. So if you're remotely interested and you think you fall into that category, please do reach out. We'd love to talk with you about our opportunities. Usually people who are in bioengineering are a, are a good fit. People who are interested in developmental biology can be a good fit too, depending on their interests. If you kind of check out our website and think that those research areas kind of fit remotely with something you might be doing, definitely reach out. In general, we like to fund people who are already located at an institution doing research there. So for instance, if you're a postdoc at UCLA, and you want to pick up a culture media project there with your current PI, that's a great, great option. Something like that is something we we would be um, excited and considering. And you guys have a conference coming up in July and I believe the Boston area, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Our conference is July 20th and 21st at the MIT Media Lab in Boston. And we'd love to see you there. It's going to be a really interesting mix of investors, companies, researchers, and scientists in this space. So we hope to see you there. Yeah, I'm going to come. I I look forward to it. Yay. Oh, that's great. That's really wonderful news. I'm so glad. well, I, I can watch you make ginger beer. I won't drink it. <laughs> you can teach me. There are good ways for people to follow along and be. I know that like you guys accept donation stuff. So is there like what are the, like the best ways to be helpful? Like a listener's like, hey, I want to do more of the slab going meat and be supportive. So what can that person? Do? The first thing to do would be to go to our website and sign up for our newsletter. That's totally free, and then you can stay a bit in the loop on what we're doing. And then if you if you get even more excited and you want to support what we're doing and learn a little bit more you can donate money to us and then you'll get on top of the newsletter our donor update as well which will give you kind of a minute by minute of what's going on in the lab a little bit so you'll get an update from our fellows um, that actually is kind of like looking over the fellows shoulder in the lab so you'll get to see some microscope images that they've been generating for their research some actual data that's pre-publication so that's one of the exciting things that we share with our donors is um, kind of this really like super fresh work straight from the lab before before it gets published so usually usually people don't get a chance to see things like that until they they've really been been kind of processed a lot down the road and instead of that we like to show share these findings as early as possible and share share the progress that our fellows are making all right so newsletter donation conference do you guys have like a twitter or like any social media things that people like would like we do yeah so instagram and twitter are definitely both things we're we're very excited about and that we keep very much up to date so please check us out there that was kate from new harvest we talked about some of the great things that are coming on in cellular agriculture in this episode you can find them at new harvest org on twitter new org to find the website Facebook is New Harvest Org, and Instagram is New Harvest Org as well. Thank you for joining us today with Learning with Lowell. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell Was Here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday, new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you. (laughs) 